Hello! Welcome back to Star and Flurry. Good to see everybody. Well, I can't see you, but you can see me. I have the baseball game of the Seattle Mariners playing the Texas Rangers in the background. So if you see flashes of light, that's where that's coming from. Um, I'm back to um, talk about part two of Nancy's Van Adventures. I picked up the van. That was an adventure. Um, and then a really interesting realization today So um, that combines all of that. Um, so Nancy's Van Adventures. So, um, I don't know if I said this in the last video, but she does have a name. My previous name, uh, van was named Meru based on the, um, because that was my inspiration to finally get a life and, um, was the movie Meru starring, featuring Conrad Anker and Renan Oosterk and Jimmy Chin. And, um, which is a fabulous movie. It's playing now streaming on, as, t as of today, streaming on Hulu, I believe. And it's worth a watch because it's so freaking good. Anyways, um, so I, I wanted to name my van. I wanted to give a nod to my previous van name. I love that name. Meru was just part of what became that adventure. And so I ended up naming her um, Sadie Meru. So that's her new name. I don't know if I mentioned that, but I'm mentioning it now. Again, just in case. Okay, th secondly, um, um, so... I go to pick up the van on Monday. So today is Friday. So I go pick up the van on Monday, drive over. Well, actually, I rented a car. There was all this kind of trying to figure out how I'm going to do this. I finally was just rent a car, rent a car, drop it off in Sandy, Oregon, and go pick up your vehicle. So I did that. And it was a very uneventful um excursion I sweated it all night you know whenever it's like having a test in the morning it's like is my timing gonna work and um and it threw me off when I got to the rental place they were like running behind there was a line I'm like a line at the rental car place what's going on but I ended up getting a great car I was very excited a Nissan Rogue I don't know if anybody's familiar with that but it was a great little vehicle once I figured out how to work everything um and uh, anyway, so I uh, drove over to the place and did a, like a two-hour walkthrough with the people to talk me through the how to work the van. Um, it's very different than my last one, very similar and yet very different because they've upgraded so many things, the batteries, and it's just a million things that are more to keep track of, which hopefully eventually I'll figure out. Um, I did make my joke to the guy. I said, you know, when my previous van, when everything, any time, pardon me, any time anything went wrong, I'd just press all the buttons and eventually it would reset itself. And he goes, yeah, that's pretty much how it works. <laughs> and he was serious. And so I'm like, okay, well, good. So I have it, I have it down. Not really. But anyway, so, uh, so I go to pick it up. And I think I mentioned my previous videos, a bit of an upgrade. I went from a Ford Transit van to a Mercedes Sprinter uh, chassis. And um, the interior is virtually identical, except for a few things. And I'll express my, I don't want to say disappointment, but my, oh, God, why didn't I see this? Um, the, the few changes in the um, interior of the van, but whatever. So I go pick it up, go through the walkthrough, blah, 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 go through all the paperwork, sign everything, everything's good, here's your keys, off you go. So I had about a two and a half, draw, a two and a half hour drive back to Bend, and I get about halfway back, well, maybe, hmm, let's say, at least a third, let's say a third of the way back. And there's a portion of when you're going up over the Cascades where there's just a bubble of no nothing, no cell service, no, don't even. So I'm, I'm just about to enter that bubble when the frickin' check engine light comes on. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. I have less than 100 miles on this vehicle and the check engine light is on. So I make a call to the, to the place and, and I talk to the guy for about one minute and then boom that phone call drop and I had no service. So I'm like, okay, what do I do? Okay, what do I do? And then to top it off, so I'm driving, like trying to figure out what I'm going to do because check engine lights are a big deal. You know, it's not change your oil light. It's big freaking deal. Check your engine. So, and then on top, so I'm driving along trying to decide, you know, I've got to pull over and turn around and, do, or do I just drive to my town and get it fixed? Get, get it looked at there. What, what do I do? So I'm kind of trying to decide that. And all of a sudden I hear this. And 
and I look behind me, and there's like maniac in a truck. Not a big, not a semi, but a freaking Ford Ranger or something. Eh, eh, eh. And I'm like, Jeebus, what the frick? You know, and then with the check engine light on, I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm on fire. That ve- I'm in a vehicle that is on fire, and this guy's about to save my life. So I like, uh, you. thankfully, oh my God, thankfully there was a slow vehicle turnout about a, a mile up. And so, I mean, I, it was just there. And so I was like, Jeebus. So I pull over into it, thinking this guy's going to pull behind me and say, lady, you've got a problem. He just bombs past me and starts doing the same thing to the next vehicle. And I'm like, you better have a freaking pregnant lady giving birth in that Ford to be causing this kind of trouble on this road. On the other hand, I'm thinking, oh, my God, thank God, I'm not burning up. (laughs) I mean, I did get out to check, (laughs) and I was not. And so I was like, okay, good. And I was able to check, like, engine temps and oil temps and all that. Everything was normal. What I didn't know was how to dig deep enough. These systems are so amazingly amazing now that literally, I mean, I could have probably pulled out the, the book and power through to find out how to find out what my problem was but I didn't even know the question to ask that's how more detailed this vehicle is in terms of information it wants to give you I had no idea where to look so I didn't even bother with the manual because I was like I don't even know what this I don't even know what this is called I mean check engine I don't know guess check engine light but it'll probably just say this this light here be sure to check your engine (laughs) so so Anyways, so I so after that debacle of the guy uh, honking, so I finally turned around, drove the 40 minutes about, I think it was 40, 40, 50 minutes back to the dealership. And I was, once I got sales service, I did call my sales rep, who has been really cool. Name is Mickey. Give him a shout out. Johnson RV, which is a, has been a really great experience in, in every way, shape or form compared to my previous experience with a similar faction of that same company. Um, I won't name them, but it was an arduous task. Anyways, um, so I called Mickey, and he was like, okay, so he, I explained to him what was going on, and he was like, oh, my God, first thing he did, so I'm so sorry this is happening, um, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, nose running. And um, and he said, but I'll tell you that I think, he goes, I'm not diagnosing your issue, but We've had issues with these brand new Mercedes Benz, and I'm like, well, that's unacceptable. He goes, no, no, let me finish. <laughs> Is they have a what's called a particulate p- particulate device within the vehicle that I guess uh, take uh, handles emissions and and senses what's going on in there. And that this particular sensor is particularly bad at um, going through its first round of sensing. Um, and that may have been what kicked off the light. Um, on the other hand, it could be a it could be a bad sensor. Well, he didn't even go there. He just said it could be that. He said, on the other hand, it could be something else. So bring. So I'm glad you're heading our way. Bring it back. We've got a guy here. I'll have him standing by with the... They have a thing that they insert into the vehicle. They could run the code and find out what's going on very quickly. So, um, you know, and of course my first thought is I'm going to get there. I'm going to have to walk up to some stranger and tell them the whole story again. And they're going to, but I, I drove up and the guy comes out the door. His name is Chris. Shout out to Chris Johnson RV, Sandy, Oregon and Mickey Albert Johnson RV, Sandy, Oregon. Thank you for taking care of me. You're the bomb. You're both the bomb. Everybody over there is the bomb. Anyways. So even my previous guy, Corey, who I miss very much, but he's off doing something else. Anyways, um, so Chris comes out with his tool, his not a tool, it's a device, electronic device, and he's going to figure out what's going on. And he was not, um, I mean, they were very honest with me. You know, we're not a fix-it place. We're not going to be able to repair the vehicle if it's a serious situation. But, um, but let's cross that bridge when we get there. So... Um, he stuck his little tool in. He said it's going to take a while, you know, five minutes or so. So go go get a beverage in the lounge. They have a very well-stocked lounge, uh, which is really cool. So I go in there and kind of try to, you know, decompress. You know, new vehicle, check engine light. I'm pissed, basically. But I don't know what the problem is, so I'm trying to retain or refrain from being pissed and tell everybody what's going on. <laughs> And, you know, because you hear these people, these stories about people driving their new RV off the lot and it, like, falls apart. 
in a minute. So, you know, I was hoping that was the situation. So the guy comes in and, and says, well, the good news is it's exactly what we thought. It's the particulate sensor. And so it's one of two things. It, it's either um, uh, bad, in which case it needs to be replaced, which is under warranty and pretty simple fix, or it just ha it was having trouble with its first round of particulate sensing, which is pretty common with these vans. So my advice to you, and, and, and my, so my advice to you is to go back to where you came from, pay close attention to where you were when it first kicked off, because if it's going to kick off, it's probably going to do it around the same, it's by mileage, I think. It's going to kick off around the same time. Um, and that would be the worst case scenario. And the best case scenario is it doesn't come on at all. The check engine light doesn't come on at all. That would be the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is it comes on, in which case you know you have a bad sensor because that's the only thing that showed up on the code reports. Um, and the good and apparently with these Mercedes Sprinters van, they'll kind of throttle you or buffer you if you don't pay attention to the check engine light, if it's a serious issue. Um it's not like they disable it. It's not like you can't drive the vehicle, but you can't drive it like over 40 or 45 miles an hour. Um, if it's a serious situation, they, you know, they're basically saying you need to go in. And he goes, the good news is this is not one of those items. So it is not programmed to disable you or buffer you um, if it's not working. So you're fine. So if it does come on, don't panic. Just go to your hometown. We have a... a um, um, they just opened up a Sprinter Van service place in there, in that city, and just go there, call them. It's all under warranty. We'll just have them call us, and we'll tell them what's going on. I said, okay, great. <sighs> Decompress. So I got back in the vehicle, got uh, halfway home, no check engine light. I was so thankful that um, it was not that issue. And later on, I did discover actually how to win my way through the the system to to go and find out if that's if that's what the issue is. So needless to say I was very happy that my new vehicle was not having a problem with its engine. So that was a good thing. So um I get home and it's absolutely smoky as Oh, it was just ap ap apocalyptic is the only way I could describe it here. We have fires about 17, 18 miles south of us and the winds were blowing directly south and so it was just bleh. And I, I mean, literally, there was ash everywhere. I, I remember looking out the window because I got home right around dusk and my vehicle lights had come on. And I, and, and there was a brief, you know, this br a brief moment of where I'm like, what? What month are we in? What, you know, what season is this? Because it looked like it was snowing. And I was like, I just was like, wait, you know, that, that moment where you're like, wait, uh, what planet am I on? And then I went, oh, wait a minute. It's, oh my God, it's ash that's falling out of the sky. And I was like, I've never, we have fires all the time, smoke all the time, but I've never been close enough to one to have ash falling out. Uh, and the last time I had ash falling in my car, I was in Portland and Mount St. Helens had blown up. So it was a little disturbing to see that, but they really uh, had a handle on them. And, um, and so I wasn't worried about my particular home location, but it's on your mind. I have a go bag. I, yeah, you know, I've got all that stuff ready. If I need it, knock wood, lucky wood, then I never will. But it was very disconcerting to see that. But anyways, um, the good news was the next day we had great rain. And I think it really put a damper on a lot of those fires. And then the next day it was as clear as a bell because the because the rain had come in from the west. So it was pushing. So somebody else was getting the smoke, just not us, for a day at least. And we'd spent several days kind of under the shroud of smoke, and it just felt like somebody threw a blanket over your house. It was just horrible. So it was so nice to see the sun and the blue sky and clouds and the whole nine yards. So that was that was a very nice change. So anyway, so that's my story about my band. It's like the check engine light, ah! and then it just, everything's fine. So that's good. So we got home. So um, so the other interesting story related to this, in my opinion, might not be yours, so you know, feel free to sign off if it's not, but um, was the, the I was going to tell the origin story of why I originally bought Meru, because I, I think I've recorded this, but I don't think I've ever posted it. So I was, I was 68, 67, 68 years old at the time. Probably 67, had just turned or something. And 
w- retired and my dad had passed away and I just moved to a new city and I was kind of trying to, you know, figure out what the hell I was going to do with my life. And I mean, it's really nice not having to go to work, but what was going to be my future interests and, and what was I going to tap into? Cause I'd never had time to really think about that. And so I came upon a movie, I think it had just come out, called Meru. Simple as that, Meru, M-E-R-U. And it was about a group of three alpinists, mountain climbers, who had their sights, or one of them had their sights set and put a team together to climb the shark's fin route of Meru. And there's all sorts of backstory, and it's in the movie, and I encourage anybody... I, I just, it doesn't even matter if you're not interested in this kind of film. It is so inspirational, and it's such a moving story for each and every one of these individuals. It's a documentary. It's all real. The actors are not actors. They're the people in the movie, the people that climbed. They did all of that. Um, and Conrad Anker, Renan Oosterk, and Jimmy Chin. Shout out to all three of them um, for changing my life. So I watched this movie, and I was absolutely gobsmacked. It was so amazing and just inspirational and beautiful and moving in so many different ways. I just can't even describe the film, and it's not horribly long, so it's worth a watch. Um, And it's suitable for kids, I think, really. I think it would be interesting to them as well. So there's, you know... Okay, I'll stop. Anyways, so uh, I watched that movie, and I was I remember getting d- done with it like maybe the third time that I had. As I'm a firm believer, you watch a movie once, and you're always waiting for what's going to happen next. And then you go back and watch it the second time, and you know the story, so now you can kind of focus on the characters and the actual story because you already know what's happening. So you begin to focus on how that's going on. And then the third time around, you get to focus on the score, the music, um, how it moved you, how how they utilized it within the film, and and then it goes on. All you just start it, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time you watch it, all these other avenues open up for brilliance that you get to witness, and so um, so I'm a proud member of the Ben Film Festival because I love film, and I'm not um, always accurate about it. I'm not always um, in depth, like I just spoke about in movies that I see, but in the ones that really move me, those are the ones that I see. Um, I mean, there's several on my list that I've seen 20 times, 20, 30 times, because there's always something else going on that I didn't see, you know, the 19th time around. I see it on the 20th. So, um, anyway, so I, so I'm on my third, probably my third round of Meru, and get done with it, and I'm like. I remember it ended, and I'm like, Jeebus, I need to get a life. I need to do something exceptional. Not not, not not something exceptional for the world, necessarily, but something exceptional for me. And that's somewhere along the way that began to pronounce itself more loudly in terms of doing, doing this van, these van adventures. Um, and so... Uh, and so when I bought my van, I knew long before that I was going to name her Meru. There was just no question in my mind that that nod had to be there because that th- these three men were so inspiring um, to me to finally see an adventure that I could do that wasn't inhibited by my work or time, um, but, you know, a, a week vacation and having to come back to work. It wasn't inhibited by any of that. I had the freedom to, to do that. Um and so I ended up doing that adventure, and I had um, some really great times. I had some really shitty times, too. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I learned that I didn't understand the systems within the vehicle, the electric, the water, and the battery, three main, and liquid propane. I mean, there's kind of, you know, these, um, y- y- you have different power sources that you use at different things. Blah, 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 it could go on and on. Um but at the time, I knew nothing. And so um, I've, I've gone through this huge learning curve. And then last spring, when I decided to sell Meru, I had kind of given up. I, I, it wasn't like I had an experience that jettisoned me into that feeling. It was just it's, 
she's weighing on me. I have to, you know, think about, um, there was just, I don't know. I just, I just wasn't, I wasn't happy with how I was approaching my time with her and my ability to go camping comfortably. Being a single female traveler, you have issues that don't normally arise. If you're a man or a couple or a, you know, a couple with a dog or a girl with a dog, I had not that. Um, and I mean, I really spent, I mean, to, to take a moment to say, maybe I should get a dog. And I said, that's not fair to the dog. I'm not getting a dog just to protect me in my van on the few adventures that I take in her. No, that's not fair. And I didn't want the responsibility. I've had many pets over my lifetime and I love them all dearly. But I just wasn't, I mean, at a point in my life where I just don't want that responsibility. So, yeah, so I was like, oh, God, you know. So I just felt I needed to sell her. And I was able to consign her because, as a, again, as a um, older female, I thought I'm ripe for fraud. So let's, you know, or being, being I mean, I try, I'm fairly smart about the Internet and, you know, stupid stuff that comes in my email and don't click on any links. I'm fairly wise to all of that stuff. But in terms of somebody, you know, wooing, wooing the purchase and doing all the right things and then suddenly turning out that their check is a fraudulent, but I just didn't want to go there. So I thought I'm going to try to consign it. So I called the company that I purchased her through. They were happy to consign her. We had to barter back and forth a little bit over uh, time. In fact, they tried to come back at me with a lower price and I just was like, you know, no, because in that, at that moment or in that time, I thought, you know what, if the, if the answer is I'm not going to take less than what we agree to. And if their answer is, well, then we can't sell it, then when I get her back, and if they accept the price and say, okay, we'll do our best to sell her and they do, then when, you know, I was not going to, shake what I had decided to do and the answer was I'll if if the <laughs> I don't mean to be so blithe but if the universe says it's time you need to take her back then I would have been happy to do so and when we finally found when I finally found out that they had in fact sold her I was so regretful I was happy and so regretful and it was just the oddest I don't think I've ever felt that pulled in two directions ever and uh, you know, with decision making, yes, but in this case, decision had been made, and I was so not happy. I mean, it was happy that I kind of had this thing off my plate, and then not happy because I wanted that on my plate. I didn't feel like I'd given it to. I gave it two and a half years. I mean, it wasn't like nothing, but so. I sat with that feeling for a long time, and then. I'm watching YouTube, and there's a woman on there, I can't remember her name, and she just kind of says, security, you know, be mindful. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've heard them all. But she was super wise, and, and she started walking through actually physical things you could do with your van, you know, because her kind of rule of thumb is, you know, you don't want to pull out the mace in your van. You might as well just spray it in your own face. So if you're protecting yourself with weapons, or mace, or things like that within your vehicle, not necessarily the wisest choice. The Really what you want to do is buy time, because the best thing you have in your hands is your keys and your vehicle to get out of whatever situation you're in. That's what you want. So the trick is to buy, if somebody's going to pick your lock, or somebody's determined to get into your vehicle, you want to buy time to be able to grab your keys. You, I mean, first rule of thumb, always have them in the same place all the time. You don't have to be feeling pockets and where's my purse and all that. The keys are always, always handy. And you want five seconds, which is better than no seconds, to grab, leap, start, go. So, um, and I thought, why didn't I, you know, I mean, I, I guess I kind of understood that on a vague level, but, but, but I didn't secure my vehicle in any way to give myself that extra filter of confidence. So I watched her thing, and she talked about certain locks you want to add. You can add that, you know, you never want to impede your ability to get out of the vehicle, but these locks were not that. And, I mean, 
It, it was just, it was an amazing video, and it got me thinking completely differently about how I could have done this. And I was in a way kicking myself that I hadn't, why hadn't I asked these questions? Why hadn't I thought about this? Well, I just, I didn't know enough to ask. Sometimes you just don't know enough to ask. So watching that kind of started to kind of make me think around again which I did and I decided to give myself a second chance as I mentioned in my first video a second chance to do it better and do it where I could alleviate the issues that I had number one security um, that was number one oh, I hate that bubble number one solving that issue and or at least helping myself understand that issue and doing physical things that I could help that that would help me protect myself and then secondly understanding that I don't have to spend every night when I'm traveling in the van and I think I mentioned that in the first video too just kind of opening up the fact that you know, I was gatekeeping myself based on on people's lifestyles that I was watching and the truth is I mean the deal is I'm not living in my van that was never going to be the choice I'm camping in my van and if you're in a place where you don't feel comfortable, there's always a hotel. There's nothing wrong with going to a hotel. You don't have to gatekeep yourself like that. So kind of relieving some of those problems in my head made a big difference in my mind. So I decided to get second van. So I get the second van and my story is eh, she's sitting in the driveway as we speak. And I, she's fairly outfitted. The nice part about having a second van is you really purge a lot of the crap. I mean, there was a lot of crap that I had in Meru number one. And um, a lot of it, I, I look, kept a lot of the stuff that was in there because it was just I didn't want to get rid of it for whatever reason. Maybe somewhere in my head I thought, I'm going to leave this window open. Um, but I got rid of a lot of it because it just was junk that I was carrying around with me that I didn't need to. And so I outfitted her over the last few days and, and um, she's re literally ready to go, except for my clothes and food. So I'm kind of excited about that. Um, so then I wake up this morning. I always go to sleep with white noise TV, usually Bosch. <laughs> prime, prime video is probably like, how many times is she going to watch this? But I just turn it on and it just, it just runs. And what I like about it is, unlike YouTube, which stops every couple hours to say, are you still watching? Prime just lets it run. And so... Um, I just turn on Bosch, and that's what I kind of go to sleep to. I, I turn the volume down to read a little bit, and then when I'm totally tired, I put the book down, turn up the volume, and I go to sleep listening to Bosch. Um, so, but anyways, uh, it, it was a couple of mornings ago that um, I must have pressed a button wrong or something, but up came the movie Meru. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I haven't, how timely is that? I did not look it up. It just showed up. And I'm like... How timely is that? Oh, my God. I'm going to watch it again. So I turn it on, and I was just kind of, I was still in bed, but I was just kind of listening to it. It's a very, uh, the score is beautiful, but it's the visuals that make this film. And so I finally got up and turned it back to the beginning and, and just poured, made myself a cup of coffee and decided to watch it at 7 in the morning. And as I'm watching it, I'm again inspired by everything they're doing, but there was a key piece in the movie that I had completely forgotten about. Just completely. And it was that they failed in their first attempt. And it was crushing. They were like 300 feet from the summit. and But they had, they had gone through so many... T um, not problems, not problem of their creation. It was, uh, you know, weather mostly. But they had, you know, were at a point where they had no food. They they'd run out. They was just taking a lot longer than they anticipated because they had like four or five days of just snow, uh, snow where they couldn't climb. So and they were so close to the summit, but they couldn't. They were out of gas. They were out of food. They were out of energy. They were done, and they had to let it go. Um. And so they did, because they're not stupid climbers. 
and then over a period of time, they each have these kind of moments of tragedy. And I'm not talking about a parent dying or something. I mean, mo physical moments to themselves that change their perspective. Because a lot, I think one of them just said, I'm never coming back here. One of them had the motivation to go for, for a lot of different reasons, but he wanted the team to go with him. And anyway, so they go through that process and they, they do it again. And they give themselves a second chance to first ascent the shark's fin route on Meru. And they succeeded. And I completely spoiled the movie now, but it's still worth it. It's like watching Free Solo several times. You know he makes it, but it's really cool to watch the way he does. Alex Honnold, another one of my total idols. But anyways, so watch that movie because it's so good. But what it reminded me is that, look, here are these guys, premium mountain climbers of their time, who took a chance to do this one thing and failed. And they came back, they reassessed, came back, and did it again. And I was like... Thank you, universe, for bringing this movie back into my life and reminding me that it's okay to try again. In in a, it, it's okay. You learned a lot. You know how these systems work, kind of. I mean, I still have a lot to learn about inverters and that, but I know basically how the systems work. I need to learn the particulars of this particular van. I had the Ford. Ford is Ford just a lot simpler to work. Um, Mercedes has got more things going on, so it's a little um, intimidating in that regard, but I'm not going to let it intimidate me. I'm just going to give myself time to figure it out. But I was so thankful that I saw that movie again and remembered the motivation and then was reminded that failing the first time is sometimes the way that you move forward and 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 you know learn and t t bring in the knowledge that you learn bring it forward take that take that and use it and do it again give yourself that second chance um because why not if you can why not just because you failed doesn't mean you're going to fail for life it just means you failed this time so, so that's my story. So, um, thank you. Thank you for listening. And going forward, I'm probably going to, like I said, I think I'm going to kind of do a, I'm going to try. I'm not a vlogger, but I might give it a try. Just to kind of, you know, do, uh, hopefully to do fun experiences in, oh, did I tell you? Yes, yeah, Sadie Moreau is her name. To give, um, our adventures, um, a video memory for me mostly, but if they're good and they're fun, I'll, I'll go ahead and post them. So anyways, thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks for listening to my story. I always appreciate your, um, your attendance. I really do. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you later. Start flurry out.